Paul Barnes is a British graphic designer specializing in the fields of typography and type design. With Christian Schwartz, he's a partner in commercial type, an internationally renowned type foundry with offices in London and New York. Paul graduated from the typography courses course at University of Reading in 1992. He worked in the early 1990s at the studio of Roger Black, and later he became the art director of Spin Magazine. In, since 1995, he has worked independently and in collaboration with a wide range of design projects with Peter Peter Savile. Peter Savile, <laughs> sorry. Uh, he has designed logos for clients such as Kate Moss and Givenchy and created the original modern concept for the city of Manchester. In 2010, he created the modern England flags for the England football team with sportswear manufacturer Umbro. He has been a design and typographic consultant to many publishers, including The Guardian and The Observer newspapers, GQ, Wallpaper, Harper's Bazaar, and Freeze. As typographic consultant to The Guardian, he is in he was involved in the iconic redesign in 2006, and with Christian Schwartz, created the new series of typefaces. For this, as part of the Guardian redesign team, they, dis they received the prestigious black pencil from the DNAD, as well as being nominated for the Design Museum's Designer of the Year. He has designed several retail typefaces, such as the acclaimed Dalla Flota and Marion, and also corporate typefaces for the National Trust in England, and typefaces for magazines as diverse as Condé Nast Portfolio with Christian Schwartz, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, and Vanity Fair. Paul has designed new typefaces for the Daily Telegraph in London and Finland's leading quality newspaper, Helsingin Salomat. He has also created the letters used by Puma football teams in the 2010 World Cup in 19, and sorry, 2000, <laughs> 2009, so many dates. 2009, Schwartz and Barnes set up commercial type and independent. It's all, you know, legend from there, and that's it. So please welcome Paul Barnes. Uh, so uh, good evening, all. It's a great honor to talk to you, and I'd like to thank Kara and Sasha, who can't be with us, for inviting me here this evening. I want to apologize in advance if this becomes a tad shambolic at times. I'm a little out of practice. After our tour of the United States in 2015, Christian and I took a sabbatical from talking in an attempt to get things done, things like Chiswick. I'm doing this from notes, which is not something I normally do. I wanted to raise some important, at least to me, ideas and thoughts on Chiswick and type design, so I hope you will bear with me. I also want to apologize to those of you who have heard me before and will have heard some of these stories and perhaps will wonder at the small contradictions. I was, told, I was told that you will be a patient and interested audience, so I hope you will indulge me. I'd also like to apologize for any errors in my talk, whilst I would love to be as gifted as the giants of our subject, I'm uh, merely an amateur enthusiast. And finally, sorry this is longer than it should be. Um, if you get bored, please leave, go to the nearest bar, whatever. Um, a few months ago, when I received this invitation, I was wondering what to talk about. Should I play the safe game? and repeat a previous lecture or try something new. Like most things, I asked Christian what to do. His suggestion was that as Chiswick was an imminent release, surely this would be a good topic. When I say imminent, in the world of commercial type, I always have to issue a caveat. Typefaces take time. We often talk about new releases which seem to be finished, but in the end are months if not years away from release. Chiswick was a typeface that was started in 2008, and we began talking about it in 2011. If you can imagine that even when a typeface is started, the ideas within it may have existed in our heads for many years previously. I think that in talking about Chiswick might, I think that in talking about Chiswick might in some way promote the typeface, but probably for the designer, it's a good form of therapy to look back upon the process, to understand why decisions are made, and what I can learn from this. The actual production of a typeface is often less interesting than the ideas and concepts that go into a design. In talking about Chiswick, which is in simple terms a typeface that owes inspiration to vernacular forms found in the British Isles in the 18th century and beyond, I want to touch on some themes about what defines Britishness in arts and crafts and how that has been expressed in letters and type founding. Now, I've used this word vernacular, which I think most of you will understand, but I will dwell on it a little. Vernacular usually is related to language. It is the language spoken by the ordinary, whatever that might mean, of a country. It is derived from the Latin vernaculus, domestic, native, indigenous. 
In our world, we often hear phrases like vernacular architecture, an architecture usually of a district, distinct geographical area, and often relates to specific local materials and the needs of ordinary people. So a traditional cottage on the Outer Hebrides in Scotland will look quite differently from one in the Cotswolds in the middle of England, geographically 300 or so miles apart. Different materials, different climates, different budgets. Today, such differences will be reduced. Vernacular lettering, as I will be talking about, is a lettering of a geographic region, the British Isles. So here's some examples. So this is brush paint on metal. This is around 1812. Paint on glass, this is around uh, 1760. Engraved onto paper, so here's a map of Scotland. Cast in Ireland, this is from the 18th century in Wiltshire. Painted on wood, this is from uh, London around the 1870s. And of course, carved in stone. So it would appear that material and method of production still have some effect on the letter. Look at how the letters cast in iron have a quite different quality to those, cast, to those cut in stone. What connects them is an idea of how a letter could be done. You will find well-made examples of the less well so, but most seem to have what I might describe as an honesty. And if you travel, you will find that each country has its own particular vernacular. So a trip to Massachusetts, for example, and you'll see find plenty of examples of 18th century gravestones of the American version of the British vernacular. Some like this are very similar to the British style. This is from 1791. But if you look at one much earlier from 1764, this seems less aware of a kind of consistent lettering style, as we would know, but it has a vitality and honesty worth admiring. Once you have an idea of what a basic vernacular letter form might look like, you can apply it to many forms. The 19th century explosion in letter form shows a remarkable homogeneity of basic letter form. The skins may change, but the skeleton remains the same. Though typefaces often have names attached to them, for the most part, these are done by anonymous pieces. Occasionally, we will see a small signature, like E.R. Roberts. This is um, in a small village in Cornwall called Constantine. This was done in the second half of the 19th century. I would like to add, in these times, typographic and lettering nationalism isn't the narrow nationalism that we might equate with populist politicians. More, it's the enjoyment and suitability of a form to a language. It's the pleasure of seeing our shared alphabets imagined in different ways, just as we have different cuisines around the world. For me, it's also a rediscovering of the old world ways, of seeing what is relevant today. When I was preparing this, I read a quote from Mies van der Rohe, which I find pertinent to type design in letters. New materials are not necessarily superior. Each material is only what we make of it. Back in 2008, I was approached by Wolf Ollins, the famed branding agency, to create a typeface for a national institution, of which they weren't privy to tell me until I signed a non-disclosure agreement, which increasingly seems to be part of the daily routine of designers. What surprises me is when even the local coffee shop run by hipsters thinks this is necessary. The client, it turned out, was the National Trust, an enormous non-government conservation organization founded in the second half of the 19th century. Its mission can be summed up as a charity that works to preserve and protect historic places and spaces forever for everyone. It is undoubtedly one of the most loved organisations in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Scotland has its own equivalent. Its membership is in the Midlands, its staff, millions, its staff in the thousands and its volunteers in the tens of thousands. What it looks after is a snapshot of Britain from, here's an ancient Bronze Age sites such as chalk horses in the west of England, dating back perhaps to the millennium before Christ, through to the famed houses and estates that dot the countryside. But it also represents an era past, the now post-industrial mining relics of Cornwall, the house where John Lennon grew up with his aunt, or even the modernist house of Erno Goldfinger. But it's not just bricks and mortar, it's land, huge swathes of the British coast, including the World Heritage sites such as the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. When it was founded in 1895, the true scale and cost of industrialization and urbanization was becoming apparent. In the 18th century, Britain was a country where the majority of the population were country dwellers. By the 19th century, it was an urban nation. Figures like John Ruskin, the art critic, and William Morris railed against the Victorian industrial society they lived in. While technology was offering new possibilities and new wealth, they saw a huge huge costs in human happiness. Morris, as we know from his typographical adventure and other creative endeavors, saw salvation in a return to the past. 
Just after Victoria had reached the throne, the typ typographic revival of Caslon had begun, but Morris wanted to go further back to the medieval era. The movement to the cities and urban living was, of course, counterbalanced by what the new forms of transport would allow. As quickly as you could reach the city, you could leave the city. This allowed the increasing sprawling of the urban environment, but equally allowed people to rediscover where their ancestors lived. One could take a train to the country and then use a bicycle to discover a world beyond this. It is only at the end of the 19th century that the great British public truly discovered the country and all that it means. What were the public attracted to? Something that was vastly different from their day-to-day -day existence. A place where things seemed simpler and more idyllic. It is often assumed that our forefathers had lived a more bucolic, Arcadian and pastoral life. This painting by George Stubbs, The Reapers, painted in 1780, represents a kind of, you know, this kind of vision. But The Reapers is an imagined, idolised vision. Look at the weather, perfect. Look at the clothes, so clean. Look at the benign master. Instead, life in the country was hard. The average person lived a short life, often in poverty, working long and arduous hours of manual labor. Death was never far away. A visit to a graveyard will give you some idea of the constant mortality. But the point of Stubbs' painting is an imagined world, and for those who lived in the 19th century and beyond to our own time, the imagined nirvana is often better fantasy than the reality of the time you live in. People talk of escaping to the country, and it's something most urban dwellers feel from time to time. Octavia Hill, who is one of the founders of the National Trust, said, the life-enhancing virtues of pure earth, clean air, and blue sky. This is a constant in Britain, something we keep returning to, departing the modern world and finding something in our past in the hinterlands of the country. Sometimes it's just an excursion. Sometimes it's a permanent departure. We can see it in many of the arts and music, much of this is dealt with in a book called Electric Eden by Rob Young, where he talks of music born out of the battle between progressive push, the modern world, and nostalgic pull of the past. So we can see it in folk revival of, say, Cecil Sharp, the pastoral music of Vaughan Williams, through to the interest in returning to the country and folk traditions. So in the music in the 60s of, say, Traffic or Led Zeppelin. This is rural retreats and making songs about long forgotten mythical battles and the path of barley from grain to alcoholic drink. The cover of Led Zeppelin IV shows some of the tension between the modern and traditional. The painting of a rural gentleman on the soon to be demolished terrace house, and the back cover then reveals high rise modern living in the background. Though the National Trust collection policy has widened, its strongest draw is still that of the country house, of the landed gentry, even though most of us would have been below stairs and merely been servants. This is a world you might know. This is the world of Downton Abbey. You can see what started as simply conservation is now part of the tourist business, one of the key parts of the British economy. But how can all of this be encapsulated in a typeface? What describes the National Trust? How can this cover both the idyllic past but the need to be increasingly forward-looking, to be attractive to the future generations? For many years, the style of the National Trust was eclectic, in many ways reflective of where, what it was. The only unifying item was the famous oak symbol, which had been originally created in 1936 by Joseph Armitage, which was later updated by the famed illustrator and designer David Gentleman. Through the 70s and 80s and beyond, design became more and more of an important part of the National Trust, through identity for the dissemination of information, a means of promotion, and a ways of, means of wayfar wayfaring. But by the time Wolf Ollens were appointed, this was three typefaces and what we might call hunting green, supported by this oak and acorn motif. The three typefaces, Albertus, Bembo, and Helvetica, are all fine typefaces. I would perhaps even go so far to argue that Albertus is a classic. It chiseled features seem to reflect a letter hewed out of metal, stone, or wood. To the casual observer, it seems to be a typeface that is the very essence of what a heritage organization should be. But though the Albertus revival was about to begin amongst the cooler graphic and type designers in the late 2000s, Albertus seemed dated at this time for the National Trust. It was created, of course, by Bertolt Volpe, a German emigre, but it does seem to have a kind of Englishness, and importantly, it does fit very well with the acorn. But Bembo and Helvetica do not really have a British feel at all. Bembo is Italian in roots via mon monotype and sulfur, and Helvetica is Swiss or international modernist in tone. So what would the thinking be behind a new typeface? It's a question at commercial type we always ask clients. Why can't this be expressed by a typeface that already exists? 
are not cancel on or fry not British enough or take Gil Sands. It's contemporary yet timeless. It's warm, friendly, and for many, it's very British. Perhaps the fact that it's ubiquitous counts against it. It's the typeface of the BBC, but also in the world of identity, it's not ownable, which is something we hear a lot of today. What Wolf Ollins wanted was something that was more reflective of the National Trust and where the organization needed to be positioned. Reflective of its heritage as a heritage organization, but also forward-looking and attractive to the next generation of members. As important is the cost of creating a new typeface compared to the cost of licensing a pre-existing typeface. With an organization with multiple design agencies and hundreds of computers within its organization, any license of a pre-existing typeface would be costly and often restrictive in its use. So what should this typeface be like? While the typeface was changeable, the oak and acorns as the most identified part of the National Trust could not disappear. Should the typeface be modern? Should the typeface be traditional? Should the typeface be inclusive? Or should it be exclusive? Or should it be many things that might at times contradict each other? So where do we begin and where do we go? Like most journeys, this one starts off at St. Bride's Printing Library. Before Wolf Ollins approached me, they went looking for a British, what a British typeface should be. Between the specimens, they discovered the path that James Mosey had tread more than 40 years previously, that of two key essays, the English vernacular, which appeared in Motif in 1963, but more importantly, The Nymph and the Grot in Typographica in 1965. They were drawn to this small inscription. I'm sorry about the kind of low quality. It's um, scanned from a, uh, the book, so it's not so great. They were drawn to this small inscription cut sometime in the 18th century in a small grotto at Stourhead in the west of England. It's a tantalizing glimpse of what would have been appeared at the time of radical style. Quite what it is is an interesting question. Is it a serif letter where the serifs were forgotten or deliberately cut off for the main part? At the time Mosley wrote the essay, it was seen as perhaps the key precursor to what was to come, the 19th century and the future era of the Sands. When he came to revise the essay in 1999, new examples had appeared, and Mosley was a little circumspect about this. Perhaps the inscription hadn't been cut at the time, and perhaps this wasn't the forefather of what was to come, but a simple curiosity that appears throughout the history of lettering. All of this is contained in footnotes. Wolf Ollin's excitement that the original Sands might exist on National Trust property overcame any details that perhaps this wasn't the missing link, or perhaps more problematic, that it had been destroyed by workmen in the late 1960s and eventually replaced with a new inscription in the same style by James Sutton. I think it's an interesting example, but it suffers from being unsure of what it actually is. It is hesitant in removing its serifs and several of the letters, such as the lowercase g, so an uncertainty of form. Whether it be the pioneer of a new style did not, in my eyes, make it a convincing form to base a corporate identity. After some convincing, Wolf Ollins abandoned their proposal to use this as the starting point, though it would have been an interesting narrative to sell to the client. It would only have only served as a strange display face. The voice would perhaps touch on some part of the National Trust's identity. It is a whimsical, naive letter, but, but when turned into permanent type, it becomes less convincing. While an eccentric piece of lettering proved to be a dead end, the idea of a British sans serif that came from the dawn of the revival of the form seemed to have sparked a huge amount of interest. Mosley essay, of course, makes the point that once he started looking for early sans serifs, he found them everywhere in the late 18th and early 19th century, in architectural drawings, on sculpture, on maps, on coins, on medals, to name a few examples. And two, exa two directions became apparent. That of the contrasted example that one sees at Stourhead, and the other is that of the monolinear form, which we see in the architectural drawings made by Sir John Soane around 1780. Both approaches appealed to Wolf Ollins, in particular the example of the monolinear-like form, which eventually came to fruition in the so-called Egyptian of William Caslon IV. This first sans serif, which was first shown around 1816 to 1819, has many appealing features to a design in the 21st century. Firstly, one knows what one is getting. The typeface still exists in metal, having been last cast in the 1980s. But it is also well cut and looks to our eyes to be almost contemporary. The letters are geometric in style. The O and C are perfectly round, and the S could come from Futura, or more obviously in close to home, Johnson Sands. Did Edward Johnson know this example? And of course, for the last 20 years or more, we have been in a geometric frame of mind when it comes to sans serif, which doesn't seem to be abating anytime soon. Of course, one small problem is the lack of lowercase. 
I attempted to draw something that tried to match the uppercase, but also make something that would work for contemporary situations. It draws on 19th century sources, such as the Egyptian lowercase typefaces that had begun to appear by the 1820s. You also note the dropping of the from the National Trust, one of the defining ideas of the new identity. The other direction, the highly contrasted form, are probably more derived from the sans serif with contrast than the serif with serifs removed. While the castle on sand seems to fit into the typographic style, these are a kind of amalgamation between type and lettering, but remain resolutely British in style. In all, it's quite convincing, convincing enough that Wolf Ollins were interested in making some layouts for presentation to the National Trust. But the National Trust were less convinced. It perhaps could be summed up in a simple but obvious comment that they aren't pretty enough. These are typefaces that were found too workmanlike in all situations. If we take the National Trust as a piece of escapism and a fantasy, then does Caslon's Egyptian best describe that? Is its everyday plainness right? Did the contrasted sans serif remain in basic form another grotesque, rather than the beautiful serif face missing its serif? So the focus turned to a headline serif typeface. The reaction I see now was perhaps a knee-jerk reaction. Having been surrounded by all the examples shown in the English vernacular in the books of on lettering tradition by Alan Bartram and Nicola Gray's pioneering work, Lettering on Building, I can see the seduction of the serif letter. When people like Bartram and Mosley wrote about the vernacular, they could not foresee the rise of digital type and how these forms might find favor again. The contrast that we see in most of these examples, whether it be, oh, I already have another one. Thank you very much. I can have a little breather there. Now, where was I? Anyway, so, a bit to go. The contrast that we see in most of these examples, whether it be the famous Baskerville slate or on a gravestone, whilst not modern in the sense of the typographic world, have all the exact qualities of the modern, high contrast and extreme between thick and thin strokes. For Wolf Ollins, this seduction took the form of linotype Dido. What they proposed was that a serif typeface could be used for headline purposes, and then a sans serif could do the legwork that all identities do. They weren't serious in using linotype Dido, just that it would become a placeholder. I was concerned that if it was passed around too much, that the National Trust would settle on this. I think that apart from its continental roots, should a heritage organization appear not to know what its own heritage is, it is perhaps a cliche of elegance. As I have said earlier, I believe as a type designer, we should always inform a client if I believe a typeface can do the task equally well. In this, I think Brunel, a typeface that has even longer gestation than Chiswick, 20 years and plus, counting, would make a suitable headline typeface for the National Trust. It's English Georgian in time, almost parallel with the life of Jane Austen and all that is associated with it. But for whatever reason, it was rejected, perhaps the fact that it wasn't ownable, perhaps because it already existed, and perhaps it wasn't obviously beautiful and pretty. But what makes the many examples we see in the vernacular or the English lettering tradition prettier? Typefaces in the 18th and 19th century were cut by hand, but why might they be considered less beautiful or pretty in the eyes of a designer? What was lost in the making of metal type? Of course, despite its handmade quality and its punch, each character is simply an archetype. Every A is the same, every B is the same. Lettering changes constantly, the human touch is visible, and it feels handmade, which gives it a uniqueness we find attractive. I think also it's, it's the nature of metal type. The metal body is restrictive, that part, part of the quality of handmade lettering is that it knows no boundary, especially in scripts and italic forms. And beyond that is the way we make typefaces now. It is easy to make typefaces quickly by simply copying and pasting. Every serif can be the same and often is. And we can measure the thickness of everything. So every vertical stroke is the same. Handmade lettering never has this accuracy and repetitiveness. But I also wonder if they identified the handmade with the rural and the country and modern typefaces with the urban industrial. The handmade appears to be more of a piece of escapism. Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice here. It's also worth considering why within one nation a highly developed style was created that was so often well-crafted. This can be explained in part with the simple notion of supply and demand. Britain's economy by the 18th century was increasingly one of the merchant, a merchant who would need to record what he is doing. This is where the copper plate or roundhead style appears from. This is, of course, not entirely British, but was a development of a style that came from the continent in the 17th century. With the size of the British economy and the relatively small size of the nation, the style quickly spread. With many people practicing, so the style developed. 
The nature of being an island is also that once the star began, it could do so in isolation, which further speeds its development. But also by the 18th century, the demands were those of an increasingly consumer society and the demands for fancy goods. And it would appear that the British expression is not as much in art as in it might be seen on the continent, but often in the perfection of craft and manufacturing. So think of the invention of Jasper Ware by Josiah Wedgwood in the 1770s, or Thomas Chippendale and his furniture. And then the architecture of the 18th century in the Georgian style. A style we can see in works in many materials in many sizes, from country houses, such as Chiswick House, where Chiswick gets its name from. This is by Lord Burlington, 1729. Through to small buildings, like the lettering style that could be turned to any new problem, a duke's house could be shared stylistic qualities with an industrial building. So here is the Soho Manufactory of Birmingham, built for Matthew Bolton, a contemporary of Baskerville in the 1760s. It is one of the first purpose-built factories, but appears to stylistically not be unlike one of the grand houses. So the British had a taste for well-crafted goods and also had the desire to be good at making them. Contemporary foreign travel writers duly noted this. The Swiss writer César Francois de Sousseau noted in 1725, the English craftsman works to perfection. And Pierre-Jean Grossley writes of the English and the perfection of craft work. We might also notice that with Caslon, after centuries of mediocrity, the British finally got to grip with type. And the 18th century seems several major figures also in type founding. So we have, of course, Baskerville, Fry and Moore, up in Glasgow, Alexander Wilson and Son, Richard Austin, and the various foundries who, who cast his work, such as John Bell and later S and C Stevenson. And finally, at the end of the 19th century, uh, 18th century, Vincent Viggins. Could we draw an aesthetic line between, the, say, the vernacular letter, type founding, and the pottery of Wedgwood or Chippendale? Perhaps, or has that connection been created after the fact in our eyes? And it would seem that the Britain still has a reputation for certain goods. Those of the country, think Hunter Wellingtons, or barber wax jackets, or for luxury craftsmanship in cars, think Rolls Royce and Bentley, or in fashion, think Burberry. Don't think, though, that this means they are made often in Britain, or the companies are British in ownership, but again, the imagined provenance is stronger than the reality. Of course, Baskerville is a model craftsman, both as a letterer and as a printer and type founder. His adventure is not only a journey in developing a style, but perfecting its manufacture. But Baskerville is also the moment that a new form of lettering crosses over to the new typographic style. When I, what I suddenly saw was that we could repeat that journey again to take the vernacular letter form and make it into type, but freed from the metal body, it would not be restricted. Letters could freely go as they chose, not excessively to draw too much attention to themselves, but enough to offer something different. So here is where Chiswick begins to take shape and starts its life. I'm sorry, this is really terrible, this one. Um, this is from uh, Alan Bartram's book on the English lettering tradition uh, from 1986, and it seems to have triggered something, but unfortunately you won't be able to see what it triggered. Um, uh, you know, um, this is one example, but more than that, I followed in the vernacular style and created something that feels more typical of its time and place. I think my immersion over many years in the British letter meant that it came rather naturally. As an actor feels destined to play a role I felt destined to work at some point in this style. And this is perhaps the point. This is a style as opposed to a series of rules. In terms of immersion, the best sources are usually churches and in particular graveyards. Depending on the stone, the depth of the cut, and then how they have been placed, stones can maintain their form for hundreds of years. Slate is perhaps the best recorder of letters. It is widely available in Britain, easy to cut and holds fine lines well. This means that within Britain you have fine pockets of particularly fine letters where slate has been used, such as the southwest of England, the East Midlands, and the northwest of England. And with these, one will find subtle differences in style. The stone that was uh, where Baskerville would have worked is often very soft, and this is probably one of the reasons none of Baskerville's cut gravestones exist today. To me, the difference between the regions in terms of lettering are like regional accents. Anyone familiar with Britain will know that the people from the east end of London speak quite differently than someone from Liverpool or Manchester, let alone someone from Scotland, Wales, or Ireland. And even within a compact area, such as the West Midlands, where I come from, accents can change dramatically within a five-mile area. So we might as well begin with the Baskerville stone, which was cut in 1720, of the 1720s, and a remarkable survival, survivor. It's an advert to show his skills, both as a letter cutter, but also as a teacher. If we take the second line, cut in any of the hands, 
is very similar to the larger size of the type that John Handy would later cut. Stress is vertical and the contrast between thick and thins are more severe. The serifs are simpler than his later type, they're unbracketed. And this is more towards a modern patch we would expect. The terminals are soft, balls and the tail on the Y curves up to a ball rather than terminating in a bulge as it does in type. The italic line shows a more angled style than his type. The capital R, for example, has the end, end stroke that we would uh, typically associate with the British style. And the swash letters T, N and M are all found in his typefaces. The associated ornamented styles clearly show the influence of it, the round had, style, round had style. Compared to the almost contemporary example shown in the Universal Penman, one can see how Baskerville was moving the form forward. I'm just going to show you a few examples from the East Midlands, 50 or so miles from where Baskerville lived. And we can see how the style kind of spread and how it changed. I'm sorry, this is really very um, hard to see, but I'll, I'll talk about it briefly. This is around 1748. Um, closer, you know, it appears to be quite unlike Baskerville, but closer inspection reveals that it shares many basic forms. Where it differs mainly is in the quality of cutting and arrangement. It's perhaps sharper and more naive in style, but has the roundness in form that we associate with the Birmingham master. This one is uh, from 1754 and is much higher in quality. It again has the vertical contrast and the bore terminals are more defined. It has a warmth to it. Look at the tail of the cap R, a typical British stylistic detail, or the beautiful sweep at the top of the lower bowl in the lowercase a. In arrangement, it is simple and dignified. The size remains the same throughout this, uh, but articulation is through capitals, small capitals, and italic. The next one from 1767 shows how freely a letter cutter could vary his style. So at the top we see black letter and we see serif, roman, and copper plate. Look here at the lowercase g on the last line, a man's good, and that kind of almost serpent-like tail to it. But it's all done with the confidence, vigor, and expressiveness. The italic and script style begin to merge in this example. The lowercase here is excessively small, which you really can't see. I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry about this. Um, and his style seems to have a roundness that reminds me of Mrs. Eve's. Little details like the swash tail, the F in the word wife of, are charming details. And this example from 1797 shows a wonderful italic style, um, which is more regular in angle, but more sloped than a typeface. But look at the tops. Where we expect a serif, we find hooks. And this is the last one from 1849, which shows a markedly different style of grainstone than that from a century previously. New forms can be seen, the ubiquitous sans serif form and the serif roman, which is more modern in style with lining numerals that would not look out of place in specimen books, yet it still retains stylistic qualities of the letters 100 years earlier. By this point in time, the British railway network was beginning to cross the country, so trends in lettering could cross the country at a greater speed than ever before. But while the design is simpler, it has lost much of the style, freedom, and grace of the earlier examples. What is remarkable, though, is the quality of these in what would be a relatively small parish of over maybe three or 400 people. And if you travel to all the surrounding churches, one would expect to find uh, a similar quality. If we compare and contrast this with what type foundries do, we will find similarities, but less variety than the inevitable stiffness of type. Baskerville's innovations that drew so much contemporary criticism from metropolitan elites of London were much admired on the continent, but clearly also within the British Isles. The foundry of Joseph Fry originated in the west of England in the city of Bristol. Its foreman, Isaac Moore, is believed to have come from Birmingham, the city of Baskerville. These typefaces perhaps surpass the quality in quality those of the originator. They have a softer quality with a beautifully tapered serif. They have a reassuring craftsman-like quality to them, like a Wedgwood pot. They eventually descended to the Stevenson Blake foundry who recast them as Fry's Baskerville and latterly they have been revised uh, as Big Moor by Matthew Carter. Alexander Wilson's types of Glasgow are almost impossible to tell apart from those of Fry. And while hand lettering will change constantly, type founding changes in comparison at glacial pace. Fry's type will be issued from 1760s to the beginning of the next century. Wilson's continue to show their transitional forms well into the 1820s, 60 or so years after the first issuing them. We must imagine that these specimens and ultimately printed types must have been examples for people to use. But as we all know, type specimens are always light on showing complete character sets. They are designed to seduce printers, not to show people how to design or copy every letter. Bickham's Universal Penman of 1733, which has probably gained greater fame as a Dover issue, issue, reissue in its time, 
is not a copy book as such, but more a demonstration, like Baskerville Stone, of how competent someone could be at making lettering. It does show alphabets, but these appear almost as afterthoughts, not as statements. These letters are more Dutch in style, reminiscent of Caslon rather than Baskerville's work. The Book of Alphabets certainly existed in earlier times. We have to think only of the famed geometrical letters of the Renaissance, but these were more like theoretical exercises and limited in real application. Moxon produced the book in 1676, which is on the left for three orders of printed letters, and George Bickham in 1760. George Bickham was the son of the Bickham of the Universal Penman in 1760, which is the geometrical construction to form 24 letters of the alphabet. But again, they are dependent on geometry. For anyone applying lettering on a regular basis, this would not be a legitimate way of making letters, especially in small sizes. The one remaining example we can find is a book published by Carrington Bowles in 1775. The title is worth dwelling on, Bowles's Roman and Italic Print Alphabets, on a large size, complete with figures, double letters, and the most useful diphthongs in the, most, in the modern taste, designed chiefly for, and this is a list of them, the use of painters, engravers, carvers, gravestone cutters, mason, plumbers, and other artificers likewise, and very useful for merchants and tradesmen clerks which should perhaps be subtitled and also type designers in the 21st century. In other words, anyone who would come into contact with letters on a professional basis. The letters are large in scale, so they could be fully inspected. But the book offers no geometric guides to assist the reader, no ideas, for example, on how to space the letters. In style, we can see features that owe something to the tradition of Dutch letters to Fell and Caslon. Others have been moved in the direction of the British style and Baskerville. So, for example, the lowercase open bold G would appear in, would have just appeared in many tight specimens. The capitals and lowercase all have a wider than we would expect width. Was this a mistake or was it a conscious decision? The quality of the lettering varies, so the curves on the bottom bowl of the V, for example, curve from the straight horizontally rather uncomfortably. The crossbar of the second A seems rather high. All the bowls of the B, D, P and Q are too wide and join the vertical stem too abruptly. The first cube with its simple tail looks like Caslon. The second has the joy of Baskerville. This is a letter for a queen or a quartet or a quill. It is magnificent. The second R shows the British style with its tail, but it lacks the confidence of many examples and the bowl is too high. And this ampersand and CT ligature all miss a trick. Had the engraver never actually looked carefully at one or did the complexity of the ampersand defeat him? The classic round and sweeping join between the C and T ends up being a limp exercise. But these comments are rather overtly critical. They are not finer than the best foundry type or the finest letterings we can find, but they are certainly better than the worst we can find. For a non-letterer, they would probably be a welcome model. He also showed a matching italic. And while the Roman might be closely linked to printing type, the italic has much more the freedom of the script and lettering, a much greater angle, and imagine that F in metal type. The letters all have a much narrower proportion. They do not seem to fit as we might expect a Roman italic in type. But this is a minor point. The lowercase is well handled. The multiple capital styles show how different forms might work in different situations. Again, we can see that some that have the feelings of the old ways and others that are moving in the contemporary di direction. Some are successful, some are less so. Anyway, I've shown a, shown a little light on some of the influences within Chiswick, but it's perhaps best, ex perhaps best to examine the typeface in detail. Like many typefaces, the initial creativity was quick. Partly this was because of the demands of two clients, but also when it comes to creation, it often done at great speed. This is to try and avoid the finesse and smoothness that would bring that this would bring. I wanted the qualities of the formal without the studied nature of Brunel. The proportions are a little more modern than we would expect. The X height is relatively large. In style, it clearly has the formal, char formal characteristics we might associate with a modern style letter. High contrast between thick and thin strokes. The serifs are unbracketed. Letters such as the C, G, and S have sharp serifs. But other letters are closer to the transitional forms. The A, the C, the F, G, J, R, and Y all have soft, bulbous ends to their strokes. The flatness of, say, the A, N, and M, and H recall the flatness of Fry. The tails on the K, and the uppercase K, and the lowercase K end in tails, like the cap R. These are not generally typographical forms, though they are found in the work of Richard Austin. The tail of the R ends in a curved tail, but this is neither the style of Baskerville, where the tail was more defined, or of the modern, where the tail was much more straighter and the curve ending was more defined. And then the eccentricity of the lowercase g. The curve of the beginning of the lower bowl, how little it moves to the left and how far the bowl extends below. 
or how wide, are the, wide the tail of the E is, or most noticeably, the long, sweeping tail of the Y. The serif structure is simple, an almost flat but slightly tapering style. The bottom has a gentle curve, but each of them has a subtle variation, perhaps a slightly deeper or shallower curve, perhaps the odd unit here and there, some deliberate, some simply, because I forgot to make it perfect. And if one measures the strokes where two should be equal, often they aren't. To the eye, one could not immediately tell, only when we examine them through the magnification that our software allows. Why? Just to leave a little warmth of human fallibility in the letters. A tiny trace of the letter makers from the past. Numerals are one of the most expressive form on any gravestone or on a clock face. Here is a detail of the clock that passed down over 300 years amongst my forefathers from Penzance. I must have passed this hundreds of times in a misspent youth. It's probably worth bringing up some examples from the west of England, in fact, only 20 miles from Penzance. These stones were all created by, um, I would imagine, the same cutter. In arrangement, they have a wonderful balance, and the letters express great joy. But look how important the numerals are to the compositions. The figures in Chiswick aligning bar are the slight ascending and descending of the six and nine, but they are smaller in height. The flat top of the three is not what we would expect in a typeface. And now let us place Chiswick next to a modern revival of the types of the Fry Foundry in Brunel, a faithful revival of the types of John Isaac Drury, on the bottom cut for the widow Elizabeth Caslon, and first shown around 1796, being the original moderns of the Caslon type foundry. You might place Chiswick as a hybrid between the two. In the main part, it seems to be a modern, but with detailing that one might associate with the earlier form. The serif structure is modern in style, the stress is typical of both. Letters like the A and G seem to fit into the earlier model. The width of capital is narrow and close to the modern model, but the proportions belong to a latter age. But as we see with the letters like the F and the Y, these belong to neither, but to the world of the hand letterer. And here comes the sting in the tail. While the clients seemed to like the typeface and admire its quality, it didn't seem quite right for them. It was too pretty. Perhaps they associated the vernacular not with the people as a whole, as I did, but with the elite or the aristocracy of a specific period, one could have too much of the pastoral Arcadian vision we associate with the country. In the end, after many months and tens of different ideas, the one that was fixed upon owed a little to everything that had come before it, contrasted sans serif, based on a basic form that could be called transitional. And if you look closely, you can see a little Scottish within it. Um, for isn't that the G of Wilson? In proportion, it has to be as economical as Helvetica, so it has a larger X height. Recalling Alberta it has a slight tapering of the terminals. In the display version, all becomes a little more exaggerated. The greater contrast, more defined thickening of the terminals. It's more modern and less obviously historical than Chiswick, but in structure, has many British-like qualities. Look at the tail of that lowercase y. Perhaps in making Chiswick, I fell into the trap we all do from time to time, imposing too much of my own ambition within a project rather than the project guiding me. Was I perhaps seduced by my love of the British vernacular letter? Too much time spent in graveyards? Perhaps. But various circumstances suggest that both Wolf Hollins and the National Trust were unsure themselves, unsure themselves of what the typeface should be. Like many projects, I would probably say, the right typeface, but for the wrong project. That from that project, four typefaces will or have appeared, Derby, Ma, Chiswick, and Caslon Doric, suggests some confusion on the part of the creative directors and the type designer. But not to worry, these have all been valid experiments with fruitful outcomes. It's at this point that Chiswick stops being a corporate typeface. Christian and Burton watched from the sides as I muddled my way through this project. Was the man in the water waving his arms or drowning? Each rejected idea eventually landed on the shores of the Hudson, was dried out and put in, put in the book of rejected ideas. Both of them liked Chiswick, certainly enough not to dismiss it, and with enough enthusiasm to suggest that the idea had some legs. Often one worries that an idea for a new typeface might be too close to another, already released. But this didn't feel like Austin, nor did it feel like Brunel. In fact, it didn't really feel like anything at all we knew of. Few typefaces reference vernacular forms, but they're often quite specific. They draw from a single source found and admired. Chiswick is a much wider and broad anthology. At some point when the National Trust job had finished and I had decompressed from the stress, I must have drawn a little more of the typeface, I believe the beginnings of the italic. As I have said before, I think that in making a typeface, derived from the handmade form, I have tried mostly to escape the boundaries of the metal body, that the examples I've been drawn to may be four more italics, but in an angle, they begin to get much closer to the angle of the copper plate script. 
If one examines foundry type, it rarely goes above the low 20 degrees in the lower case. In display sizes, Brunel to 23 degrees, transitional italics typically to 21, and Castellan to 23 degrees or so. A greater angle and virtually all characters would have to extend beyond their physical bodies. Hard to cast and for a printer a constant source of worry for fear of breakage of characters, which as we can see happened in the Castellan specimen at the top from 1739. Chiswick in its ang angle owns a large depth of bowls, its angle, angle being similar, though the widths of the characters are wider, conscious choice to blend it better with the Roman. The capital J and Y are based on those from bowls. The J is similar in style to the preferred form of Baskerville, but owes more to the style of the engraver than the typographical. Where at the top one would expect a ball, where the vertical and horizontal strokes meet, we instead encounter a kink. In the lower case, the top serifs are neither typographical or those of bowls, but one might expect if the form were hand-lettered often at speed. One looks at this sign made, I would guess, in the 1960s or 70s by the firm of Monk and Clark in well, London. The top of the B, D, H, L, and even the T is a hook. Um, that's probably one of my favourite examples of English vernacular lettering you can find. So if you're ever in Clarkwell, go and look it up. The lowercase f of, the of Chiswick sweeps dramatically, greatly overhanging the letter before and after it. The lowercase g thickens and thins in its bowl, both in bowl in unexpected places. And the lower bowl sweeps down and then up again at its top. The form of the v, w, and x are all similar to those of the typographic style, but are more dramatic. Compared to Brunel, it's more dynamic and expressive, prettier in the eyes of some. It's lost much of its constraint and it has a willfulness and joy to it. I think that the italic in some typefaces are dim second to the Roman. In the case of Chiswick, I think it is almost equal and can live by itself. So now we embark on a small detour. Chiswick may have only been on the shelf for a few months when Christian showed it what existed of Chiswick to our friends Robert Priest and Grace Lee, who were in the middle of a magazine redesign at that point. They had previously used Brunel at Condé Nast Portfolio and were looking for something similar, but in their words, prettier. I'm not sure if Christian even showed them anything else, but they were immediately drawn to Chiswick. They asked if they could show it to its, their secret client, of which we were happy to, to oblige. I think of all the surprises in what we do, finding out that Oprah Winfrey, like Chiswick, is perhaps one of the biggest. <laughs> I think perhaps as I associated the typeface so intimately with the British tradition and with the recording of the dead, I did not immediately connect it to the general interest women's magazine in the United States. But this is the life of typefaces, we never can tell where they will thrive with total certainty. And it's one of the joys to find them in unexpected places and used in unexpected ways. It was at this point that Chiswick began to grow in two directions, or rather three directions. I've always been drawn to extremes in typefaces, extreme in weights and in contrast. Chiswick began as a single headline weight, contrasted enough to be used, say, at 24 point and above, say, 60 point. But if we used it at small sizes, the contrast would be too great, the hairlines would simply disappear. The idea should be that all sizes, the typeface appears to have the same contrast. As important are, are the issues of spacing, as letters become larger, they are spaced tighter. As they get smaller, they get looser. Again, they should appear to be spaced the same of whatever size they're used. This is a relatively easy and straightforward task. We know what that, that this would happen if type had been hand cut in metal. Each size is designed for the size that it was cut. As Chiswick has such a high contrast and delicate design, it has four optical sizes. Text for sizes up to 18 point. It's obviously a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, deck for sizes above 18 point. Headlines for sizes above 30 point. And then poster for the largest sizes. The other access is weight. A challenge to make things fatter and lighter has always appealed to me. Hence the lightness of Marianne and the heaviness of Dala, Floder and Isambard. Chiswick does not become particularly heavy. The soft terminals of the A, C, F, and R seem convincing, less convincing as they get bolder, but I think that one can find fat, one can find very fat lettering in the 19th century. Often this gets closer and closer to the fat face, which Isambard and Austin ultra cover. On the other hand, Chiswick can become quite light. This is the lightness of the engraver and of copper plate. In all, mere five weights and four optical sizes, enough for the needs of Oprah for covers, for front of book, for features, for headlines. But if you look closely, not for text, where Matthew Carter's Miller does the job. In comparison, Miller looks dry and sensible, Chiswick too expressive and delicate. This was in 2010. So what could possibly take another seven years before Chiswick got released? 
Did this mammoth lecture take that long to write? Did we have nothing better to do? Well, obviously we did. Tens of custom jobs and multiple new designs, but it still seems a long time. In the rush to make the original Chiswick, we had always wanted to make a typeface that was the basic minimum, a compendium of the vernacular serif letter, but no more. We did not feel that the lack of alternatives would lessen Chiswick's ability to express the basic idea. But when we thought about the eventual release, we decided that we need to feature at least some of the forms we had seen, and also the additional characters we think are needed for com complex typographic setting. While Chiswick may be a pretty elegant serif letter, in the perverse world of commercial type, we imagine that someone might be as mad as us and use Chiswick for some technical ma manual in some far-flung part of New Zealand, at 96 point. So obviously Chiswick has more capitals in Roman and italic. For our, from, for our, from our experience, the letter makers of the 18th and 19th century would quite happily make these. And they're a useful tool to designers today. But in the world of commercial type, we pride ourselves on the extras, the brackets, the braces, the parentheses, the figures, and the at signs. And because we know that people set in capitals, we've done the same for the forms in wealth, like, well, capitals, lining figures, and all. But these are what commercial type we might call a bare minimum. Our experience as designers will have given us an idea of the small but annoying frustration when these details aren't there. But so far, we've stayed close to the shore of the vernacular, Beyond we know is the deep ocean of po multiple possibilities. Every day, the letter of, letter of work, they created new forms of letters. Why? Clearly, at times, these letters would improve the composition of words, but also show the desire for self-expression and de developing form. Repeating the same basic form would, at times, bring about boredom. And this is surely a way of relieving it. For us, this means that every new example offers the possibility of discovering something new. It's rare that after looking at a few tight specimens of the same era, we will be surprised by anything at all. Some of these forms in the Roman are simply alternatives, like a G with a ball on its lower bowl, a straight tail T, a straight top T, or a simpler Y, or a closed G and a more expressive G and Y, or even more expressive. Of course, this relies on the designer's discretion in their use, it's easy to get carried away. We were composing a wedding invitation, we might find some, something much more complicated. We were making a logo or a headline in a magazine, but these are really only the tip of the iceberg. We can make hundreds of different forms, all equally valid and interesting. So where does it stop? Really, it's a question of time. How long do we want to spend on making our a typeface? And equally, despite the wonders of open type, how easy is it for the end user? Ultimately, Chiswick is a typeface that perhaps demands more upon the design than normal. It can be used straight out of the box, but the more you investigate, the more you find. There are extensive specimens we, through our extensive specimens, we have tried to make it easy to find these forms, but still it will require some effort. And will all of this ever pay for itself? Are these really sound business practices? I will let you judge for yourself. So we have alternatives. So take the R, capital R something more like the transitional type form, something more like the form we would find in the modern of the 19th century, or the Q that looks like a modern or behaves, or one that feels like a transitional, or a K that behaves normally. And the ampersand offers multiple possibilities with a ball with a serif, with nickening of the upper bowl with a tail, and with a tail with a ball. We have the ligatures, common ones involving the lowercase f, or more decorative like the CT, and the ones that deal with combinations like the two Gs after each other or a G and a Y. Everyday concerns for a letterer and numerals offer endless possibilities as well. Not just lining and non-lining figures or small capital figures, but multiple styles beyond what we would expect. By this point in the proceedings, we'd come so far, it felt almost silly not to carry in our mad attempt at typeface gluttony. And of course, numerals mean multiple currency symbols in all of these styles, whether it be normal, lining, or non-lining. But this is merely the Roman. The italic offers even more opportunities. In one direction, the italic could become simpler, where the lower case has hooks such as the ascending stroke like the B, so a simple serif could replace it, or even no serifs at all, and the opposite, more and more expressive forms, and numerals and currency as well. Anyone who's, who buys Chiswick could spend years discovering them, and as for me, so many I've started to forget. We've tried to make it as easy as possible, but sometimes the software limits the ease of finding them. So when I was making this lecture, I had to ask Jack, who made all our specimens, where the hell are these things? I 
and I think these ones at the bottom are amongst my kind of favourites. Anyway, a commercial type Christian says, never talk about cliff count, so I won't. But I always say it's a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot of them. Ideas of a script version popped into my head, but were quickly dismissed. Instead, Chiswick goes in the direction of the sands. First, the Chiswick sands, which owns something to the nymph and the grot inspiration, a serif form that simply loses its serif. I started drawing this when I was still working on the National Trust typeface, in part as an experiment, in part as a distraction from the frustrations of the project. Contrasted sans serif typefaces appeared during the 19th century, but it's mainly a 20th century phenomenon. The earliest The earliest I have found is this form believed to have been cut by Figgins, which wonderfully says the name Barnes, around the 1850s, though it may be later towards the end of the century, as the only examples I seem to be able to find are in maps in the 1880s. The early, ex early experiments I made with Chiswick Sands seems to be an interesting sideshow, likely to remain unused until I came upon this stone in Cornwall. And I'm really apologetic that you can't see this because this is really, really important. We can date it accurately to 1825 with an edition 1831. It's truly magnificent, beautifully cut, showing how even in a remote part of the country remarkable work can be done. The black letter or capital form at the top is a typical device recalling Baskerville's slate. Then below we see a script, a Roman modern, a drop shadow, and then another Roman modern. Below comes the son who died in 1831, and here is where it becomes very interesting. John Glusas is cut in a bold, highly contrasted sands is quite different from the style used for the father. And as the reinforced style, 1831, age 43 years, two is cut in a less contrasted sands. Recalling typographical examples, we know that it was only in the early 1830s that type foundries beginning with Figgin started issuing sans serifs in great number, a decade or more after Caslon's original. It would be an interesting hypothesis to propose that the sands really gripped the west of England, the nymph and the grot ins inscription, and this is the first known inscription in sands on a building in England. This is from 1850. And then this example from Penzance, which is undated, suggests some kind of spreading of the style. This discovery, I think, gave us the confidence to finish the serifless version of Chiswick. Mostly it is simply a question of removing the serifs and the thickening, and the e thickening at the end of strokes. So the balls of the A, F, G, J, R, and Y simply disappear. This creates unusual forms, but not unconvincing. The letter retains the basic ele elegance of the serif, perhaps now seems less historical, for some more reminiscent of letters that might have been made a century or so later. But whilst the Roman offered a simple erasing of the serif, the Italic offers a new challenge. While serifs seem less integral to the Roman form, the in and out strokes are much more defining in Italic. When I made the Italic of Dala Moa, sans version of the stencil, serif stencil Dala Floda, I decided that it would be impossible to make a convincing sans italic simply by cutting off the strokes. So I sideset the problem by making a much simpler and upright style. Similar with Chiswick sans italic, I decided that a simple, little simplification would be needed. Firstly, a lower angle seemed to make sense, less, still steep but not as aggressive as the serif, where the strokes had been a small bend. Where the strokes had been, a small bend suggests where the stroke had once been, or where originally the nib of the pen had once been. Certain characters simplified the lowercase g, b, and w, for example. And the masses of swashes and alternatives are minimized. I'm sure that they would have worked in places and even been of some use, but one might say that by this point, fatigue was beginning to set in. With the sands, the boundaries of the weights can be broadened, the, light, the letters can be lighter, and they can be bolder, with the issues of terminals removed and remain convincing. So in its lightest weights, the italic seems to be almost engraved in delicacy and it is bold as is moving towards the fat face. How can we see this in terms of the vernacular tradition? Is it real or is it fake? It's not historically historical particularly. The example I showed earlier seems more of an experiment in the direction that was followed, but it seems to fit into the idea of a basic vernacular form that can be interpreted. Chiswick Fat Sands was first used in document, a high fashion and culture magazine quite different from okra. Again, the joke, jump from British vernacular to New York call may seem beyond the normal, but in context, we can see it makes sense. And here it is in use of the cover of a book designed by David Pearson about the early work of Truman Capote, 60 or so years earlier than document, but perhaps in a similar vein of cool New York. When we began this journey in the 18th century, Britain was still a rural nation. By the 19th, it was an industrial nation. 
In the words of Blake, a land of dark, satanic mills. Though this world was one completely different from the one that preceded it, it was also one that was very similar. The new factories, as I said earlier, looked similar to the Georgian stately homes. People hadn't considered that the new world should look that differently from the old world. So the new letters of the metropolis were still closely related to that of the vernacular style. The idea of an industrial Chiswick, to me, was an interesting concept. For the main part, a vernacular face, but perhaps with some influence of contemporary sans-serif typefaces, one that would be made by, their, by hand by someone conversant in the style of their forefathers. The street scenes of the 19th century were one of the most popular subjects of the new art of photography. Towards the second half of the 19th century, a London photographer, Henry Dixon, documented many such scenes. He was doing this to recall buildings that were likely to be demolished ones built in the previous centuries. All over them are fine examples of lettering, which, I'm, again, I'm sorry you can't see, but I hope you can see vaguely some sands in there. He was doing this to recall buildings that were likely to be demolished, ones built in the previous centuries. All over them are fine examples of lettering. Some are pre-constructed architectural letters made, say, in wood, but for the main part are made with brushes and paint. Clearly, the lettering artist was in constant demand. The sands are bold without any of the delicacy of the serif vernacular form but are all from the same idea of what a less should be. These letters aren't designed with the con contemplation we might put in. They are simply and quickly made, but they are done with incredible skill. Chiswick Grotesque tries to catch some of this spirit and vitality. This is the letter of the industrial age, a letter for the machine, a letter for the engineer. It tries to capture some of the simplicity of the sands, where the O simply is a geometric circle, like the letters that adorn this steam engine. It's crude, but also compelling. These are the letters made by a draftsman. And even I can't help but be charmed by the first sands of Figgins, over 180 years old, yet strangely something that still seems to be contemporary. And here we see how typefaces influence the handmade letter. The time spent on each member of the Chiswick family reduced with each a new addition. By the time of Chiswick grotesque, speed was of the essence, in part because of creeping boredom, in part because I had become more efficient in knowing what was right, and in part because I wanted the letter to be deliberately crude. The basic premise is simply to thicken the thins within the sands. It's not a universal thickening as one reaches for heavier weights for certain characters. You need a little more contrast. The skilled letter would make these adjustments, but it's not as, as considered as a skilled punch cutter would make. If we take certain letters such as the lowercase a or g, we can see that while the skins change, these are the basic skeletal forms from the serif form. Even the italic of the grotesque is a highly angled affair, closer in spirit to lettering than to the measured tone of type. The letter capital G without its crossbar is the same form that William Caslon IV or John Soane would have employed, a form that seems to be peculiarly British. And whilst both the sands and grotesque extend to fat weights, the fat of the grotesque is clearly bolder. The sands has seven weights, the grotesque eight. This seems to fit into the no-nonsense style of the grotesque and its ability to carry the extra weight without becoming a caricature, caricature of itself. Its first appearance was in a completely different style of magazine, SUP, designed by our friend Richard Turley. Richard had asked us for the most inappropriate typeface for a contemporary music magazine, and this seemed to actually be the most appropriate, so we sent it anyway. Its no-nonsense, robust style seems well-equipped for the aesthetic it was attempting to represent. See how the numbers have become simplified, three typefaces in three very different magazines. Whilst we often expect people to like all members of the family, which is it we think that we have made a family where different people will like different parts. In fact, we wonder if some people will detest one part and will love another. And we think that's fine. Christian said to me the other day, it's the same melody but with radically different arrangements. So Chiswick might be used for wedding stationery by a certain designer attracted by its unapologetic, unapologetic prettiness and beauty. And another designer working on gritty urban graphics would be attracted to robust, simplistic forms of Chiswick grotesque. For the last three or four years, we have been working on Chiswick, finally trying to finish it up. At every turn, the sensible decision was ignored. When the need to remove was a simple choice, we kept on adding. As many parts Chiswick, many parts Chiswick has sprawled, like, like a triple album, perhaps has need the heavy hand of an editor. Instead, in a counterintuitive move, we have given the public a director's cut. Even as we saw the finish line ahead, we couldn't resist the distraction. We've, we saw that somewhere between the sands and the grotesque lay another interesting byproduct, a sand with greater than normal contrast, a form that appears from time to time in examples, but generally a rarity. Here, though, is a fine sans serif for text, a vernacular letter form that is comfortable to the eye, whether it be for print or for screen. 
based in the tradition, but not of the past. Our designer, Jack, prepared a universe-style diagram to explain this slightly sprawling system. 96 typefaces in all, which perhaps explains a little why it has taken so long. A huge and long convoluted process which has involved everyone in some way, whether it be the huge technical challenges, the long hours of kerning, the constant process of proofing. As the originator of this mad scheme, I have to thank my colleagues and apologize to them. But I also owe a huge debt to those who have come before me, the lettering artists of the past and the historians who have shone the light where it was needed. Chiswick as a design encompasses many ideas about how letters can be made into typefaces. It tries to capture a style that's mostly disappeared. This was in part because of the disappearance of hand lettering as a mass industry, but also changing tastes. In part, this might be seen as the style simply running out of steam and the form is becoming more and more corrupted. But it's also the championing of Trajan as the official letter of choice in Britain. But this too ran out of steam and the country was soon full of well-crafted but insipid letters quite unsuited task. The vernacular letter can still be found. The odd workman here and there might still work in a style similar, but it's no longer a mass phenomenon. But the many typefaces I've created all have a particular fascination to me. In all I've learned something, perhaps in Chiswick I have not only learned something, but I also hope that I have passed on some of this knowledge and passion to others. I realised that Chiswick was similar to escaping to the country, but here it was trying to escape many of the current typographic trends, and almost perversely attempt to rediscover things rediscover something lost in the sands of time. I hope that I've illuminated some of the old traditions that can offer new directions. For commercial type, our measurement is not just in pure profit. We understand that Chiswick is not a typical typeface, and it is one that will take more time and explanation than much of our library. What we hope is that we offer something new, whatever its sources are. So, thanks. <laughs>